chapter 2. Together with Christ in the church. From the garden to the church, the book of Genesis through the book of Acts. In the beginning, God three in one created everything and then made the man and the woman in his image and likeness. Each one knew God. God brought the woman and the man together into a remarkable one flesh relationship, united in marriage, Genesis 2, 24 and 25. They were naked and not ashamed before each other or before God who spoke with them. Everything was very good. Satan rebelled against God. He came in a serpent and attacked the first two humans in the Garden of Eden. Satan in the serpent, the murderer and liar, got each one to take a bite of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They died. They covered themselves, then hid from God. Genesis 3, verses 1 through 8. How did God respond to the two bites taken by the woman and the man? How did God respond to the answer each one gave to God's questions? God promised conception for the woman. Her seed would crush Satan's head. God cursed the ground because of the man, but God did not curse either the woman or the man. God drove the man from the Garden of Eden and blocked the way to the Tree of Life. The man and the woman would have sorrowful toil as they worked the cursed earth outside of the Garden of Eden. Genesis 3, verses 9 to 24. The Old Testament. The way to reconciliation with God was clear to the children of Adam and Eve. Sin resulted in death. Forgiveness of sin was possible through the death of an acceptable substitute. Abel took that way when he offered a lamb of sacrifice. Cain rejected it. The children of Seth down to Noah offered acceptable sacrifices. The children of Cain did not. Through the years, from Noah to Abraham to Moses to the prophets, God continued to seek and receive anyone who got forgiveness for their sins. Moses was told by God to set up the tabernacle where sacrifices were offered. God visibly was present at the tabernacle and later at the temple built by Solomon, King David's son. As time passed, God's revealed word was written down in the 39 historical, prophetic, and poetic books of the Old Testament. They were filled with the history of the descendants of the woman and the man from the Garden of Eden. The Psalms and the other poetic books were filled with praise for God and with teaching on how to live for God. The books of the prophets revealed more of God's will and God's plan. The New Testament the first five books of the New Testament told about the coming earthly ministry and ascension of Jesus and about the ministry of the Holy Spirit through the first generation of the church. During this time, instructions on how to live for Christ were written down and sent to groups of believers. Finally, John, the youngest one of the twelve who had walked with Jesus, received and wrote down the Revelation, the last book of the Bible. John the Baptist was a prophet. His work was to prepare the way for the promised seed of the woman, Luke 3, 1 through 18. John the Baptist preached, I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit, Mark 1, 8. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. The Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wild desert to be tempted. There, Satan tried to cause Jesus to sin. The results were not the same as in the Garden of Eden. Jesus was not deceived nor did he rebel against God. Satan attacked Jesus in three ways. One, eat something God never intended to be eaten. Two, risk yourself and defy certain death. Three, follow me and, and rule right now. All three times, 
Jesus quoted God's words and obeyed God. He did not follow Satan's murderous lies. Luke 4, 1 through 13. Then, by his public miracles and teaching, Jesus showed that he was the promised seed. He fulfilled more than 300 prophecies that were written about him throughout the Old Testament. He came to die for the sins of the world. As that day approached, Jesus told those who walked with him that though he would no longer walk beside them, the Spirit would be in them. John 14, 26, 20, 22, Acts 1, 8 to 15, 1 Corinthians 3, 16, 16, 19, 1 John 4, 13 through 15. He was condemned to death, even though he was blameless. Jesus died on the cross as a substitute. He paid the penalty of death for all sinners. He was buried. On the third day, he rose from the dead, the firstborn of all who receive everlasting life. Revelation 1, 5 and 6, Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. That day, and over a period of 40 days, Jesus met with his disciples, or messengers, and his other followers, and explained the Old Testament to them. He gave orders to tell all peoples the good news of salvation through the blood he shed on the cross. On one of these occasions, Jesus said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all peoples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Jesus promised the power of the Spirit to spread the good news in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Luke 24, 44 to 49. Matthew 28, 19 to 20. Acts 1, 2 through 8, 2, 1 to 41. Then he ascended to heaven. Acts 1, 9. Hebrews 10, 12. The church. Jesus and his followers united. After Jesus ascended to heaven, men and women followers of his began meeting together. There were about 120 of them, Acts 1.15. Ten days later, the Holy Spirit visibly came upon them and gave each one the power to tell the good news of Christ to the many thousands of Jews who had come to the city of Jerusalem. These Jews came from many nations to celebrate the Feast of First Fruits, or Pentecost, 1 Kings 8, 10, and 11, Acts 2, 1 to 4, 17 and 18. Those who became followers of Jesus were baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, as Jesus had instructed in Matthew 28, 19. Followers of Jesus believed in the covering of their sins by the blood of the Savior. A follower was born of the Spirit, John 3, 3, 5 through 8. The number of new followers added that day was about 3,000, Acts 2, 38, 41. They worshiped together in the temple. They gathered together regularly in homes, continually devoting themselves to the teaching of the messengers and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer, Acts 2, 42. What teaching? The messengers of Jesus taught what Jesus had explained to them about the Old Testament during his ministry and after his resurrection, Luke 24, 44, and 45. From personal experience, they taught about the events in the life of Jesus. They had heard the public preaching and private teaching of Jesus, and they repeated his words. As Jesus had promised, the Holy Spirit taught them and reminded them of everything I have told you. John 14, 26. Over time, the 27 books of the New Testament were written down. They were God's inspiration. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that all God's people may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. The four Gospels and the book of Acts told about the events and words of Jesus and the first generation of followers of Jesus, 
The rest of the books of the New Testament were written down as letters to be delivered to others far away. The 22 letters from Romans to Revelation gave teaching and advice. These letters were not organized as stories that included events and words. Instead, they were organized by ideas grouped in word patterns. Over time, those who had been with Jesus had all passed away. But by then, the 27 books of the New Testament had been written by them and others who were inspired by the Spirit. The followers of Jesus who were born of the Spirit with everlasting life received spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians 12, 7, Romans 12, verses 4 through 8. Some followers received the gift of serving the other followers to build them up. Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. The result among all followers was growth until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, Ephesians 4, 13. Every follower played an important part in the life and health of the whole body of Christ, 1 Corinthians 12, 7. This included telling the good news to everyone, even to the ends of the earth, Romans 10, 13 to 15, Matthew 28, 20, Acts 1, 8. Paul. When the number of followers of Jesus in Jerusalem first began to grow, the religious leaders who hated Jesus hated them as well. One of the followers, Stephen, who was full of the power of the Holy Spirit, was tried and put to death for his teaching about Jesus. That day, a violent persecution broke out against the followers, and most of them fled the city. They were scattered to many lands. In each place where they found themselves, they told others the good news of Jesus Christ. Soon, more and more followers of Jesus were meeting together in many places near and far. Acts 7, 51 through 8, 4, 9, 26 to 31. Saul of Tarsus was a scholar who carefully followed the religious rules and regulations he had learned, but this did not help him walk with God. He was involved in the killing of Stephen. He persecuted the followers of Jesus in Jerusalem and beyond. Later, he called himself the worst of sinners, 1 Timothy 1, 15. But Jesus appeared to him. Jesus caused him to see how wrong he was. Saul turned from his sin and became a follower of Jesus, Acts 9, 3 through 20. Jesus gave him the assignment to serve as his special messenger outside of Israel, especially to the non-Jews of the Roman Empire. Paul, along with his companions, was sent out by the Holy Spirit from the church at Antioch and took the message of the good news of Christ to many Roman cities and the neighboring countryside, Acts chapters 13 and 14. Paul carefully explained the mystery. The word mystery describes something that was not fully understood until it was fulfilled and revealed by God. Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem of a virgin. As promised in the Garden of Eden, Jesus was the seed of God and a woman. He was wounded on the cross and gave up his life, but he rose from the dead and triumphed over life. He offered everlasting life to anyone who accepted his death for their sins, turned from their shameful ways, and followed him. Paul called this the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed. Romans 16, 25, and 26. The Book of Ephesians. At one point, Paul spent several years teaching in the major city of Ephesus, Acts 19, 8 through 10. Later, Paul wrote a letter and sent it to the followers of Jesus in the region of Ephesus. In it, he explained that God had given him the responsibility to make known the previously hidden mystery of Christ, Ephesians 3, 1 through 9. By revelation, there was made known to me the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known, which for ages has, had, has been hidden in God who created all things. One in Christ. In an earlier letter to a different group of followers, Paul told them that they were all united in Christ Jesus. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus, Galatians 3.28. In his letter to the Ephesians, Paul explained that every follower, whether Jew or non-Jew, was joined together with every other follower 
in three ways. The second way was especially important word picture. In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight that the non-Jews should be joint heirs and a joint body and joint sharers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Ephesians 3, verses 4 through 6. To picture a joint body, it is helpful to look at the body of an ant. The ant has a three-part joint body with a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. No one part alone is the body. Each part works together with the others to form one joint body. Human beings have a two-part joint body with one, a head, and two, a torso or trunk. Neither part alone is the body. As the parts work jointly together, the whole body prospers. In Ephesians 4, Paul again used the word picture of a joint body. It included the two parts that together make up the body of Christ. One, the followers of Jesus, plus two, Jesus himself. We may grow into him, the head, Christ of whom all the body grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work, Ephesians 4, 15 and 16. In English, the word body can be confusing. It may include both the head and the trunk or torso, but the English word body may refer only to the trunk and not include the head. In some languages, there's a different word that refers to both the head and trunk together. Such a word completed the image and made it all clear. But the limitations of the words used in English has led to a confusion of trunks and heads. Paul's word picture showed how followers and Christ together form one united body. The body of Christ was a two-part joint body. This body included followers and Christ himself. One part plus one part equaled one whole joint body. Paul's words in Ephesians 4, 15, and 16 did not refer to a literal body. It was a simple word picture. Followers and Christ together make up one joint body. Paul used this word picture of a joint body in Ephesians and in his other letters. Each time he used it to picture a united body. Romans 12, 5. 1 Corinthians eleven three, 3. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 27. Ephesians 1, 22. 4, 11 to 13, 5, 23, and verses 31 and 32, Colossians chapter 1, verse 18, and chapter 2, verse 19. Many of the first readers of Ephesians were familiar with the Hebrew word patterns that Paul integrated into his writing style. It's very helpful whenever possible to look into Ephesians with an eye to the patterns that were used to organize it. Here are some very important ones from the second half of Ephesians. One, in the second half of Ephesians, six passages began with the Greek words, therefore, and walk. The last one was slightly different. It said, therefore, stand. Ephesians 4, 1 to 16, therefore, walk in a worthy manner. Ephesians 4, 17 to 32, therefore, walk not in confusion. Ephesians 5, 1 to 6, therefore walk in love. Ephesians 5, 17 to 14, therefore walk as children of light. Ephesians 5, 15 to 6, 9, therefore walk very carefully. Ephesians 6, 10 to 20, therefore stand against the devil. 2. The fifth passage and sixth passage correspond roughly to Genesis chapter 2 and 3. These chapters in Genesis often have been labeled creation and fall, but a closer look revealed that chapter 3 of Genesis was not about a fall, but about an attack and its after aftermath. The two passages of Ephesians 5, 16 to 6, 9, and 6, 10 to 18 can be similarly labeled new creation and defense against attack. Paul revealed that the unity of Christ in the church was better even than the unity of man and woman and God in the Garden of Eden. Followers of Jesus who made up the church were filled with the Spirit of Christ and, when attacked by Satan, 
they could successfully stand against his attacks. Three, there were three groups of actions strung together in Ephesians 5, 15 to 6, 9. These three groups had four parts each. They followed the Hebrew word pattern of grouping together three parts plus a fourth part, as in Proverbs 30, verses 18 and 19. Paul took the fourth part of each group of actions and used the next group of actions to explain it more fully. Christ in the Church and the Acts of the Spirit, Ephesians 5.15 to 6.9. To tell the important story of the unity of Christ and his followers, Paul started the fifth passage of the second half of Ephesians with strong words. Paul wrote, See to it that you walk very carefully. 1. Careful Walking in Group 1, Ephesians 5, 15b through 18, Paul contrasted three actions not to do with three actions to do. The fourth contract, contrasting actions were different from the first three. The last action was not something to do, but something to let the Spirit do. Don't be unwise walkers. Be wise walkers, 515b. Don't be thoughtless. Make the most of your time. 516. Don't be foolish. Understand the will of the Lord. 517. Don't be controlled by wine. Be filled with the Spirit. 518. Someone who was drunk was not in control of himself. He was controlled by all the wine that was in him. In every follower of Christ was the Spirit of Christ. Romans 8, 5 through 14. Paul told followers, always, to let the Spirit be in control of them. Being controlled by wine led to certain acts. Being controlled by the Spirit led to certain acts as well. The Ephesian followers knew about the Holy Spirit. Jesus had sent the Spirit to be in every follower after he went up to heaven. In the city of Jerusalem, on the day of Pentecost, two different things happened. The first happened to about 120 men and women. These followers were meeting together in the upper room that morning. The Spirit came and gave them power to do something. They received power to preach the good news in many languages. So they started to preach to those around them. The second thing happened to the thousands who responded to their preaching. They heard, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Christ Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. Thousands of them did so and received the gift of the Holy Spirit, Acts 2, 4, 29, and 31. This is what Jesus called being born again and born of the Spirit, John 3, 3 through 8. The Ephesians who received Paul's letter knew about this. They, too, had been born of the Spirit when they first believed. Acts of the Spirit, number 2. In group 2, Ephesians 5, 18b to 21, the Holy Spirit produced acts or works in the followers of Jesus. Two were vertical and directed toward God. The second and third acts in verses 19b and 20. Two were horizontal and directed to one another. The first and fourth acts in 19a and 21. The fourth one was developed further in the third group where two or more acts, or two more acts were, were added. There was also an additional act of the Spirit. It was described at the end of the sixth passage in Ephesians 6.18. All of these acts were practical activities that followers of Jesus could do and that others could see. They were the result of being filled with the Holy Spirit. The first action was speaking to one another in psalms and hymns, and spiritual songs, 519a. This action was horizontal and directed toward other followers. What kind of speaking was this? Colossians 3.16, a parallel verse, used the action words teaching and encouraging for speaking in a parallel passage. Teaching and encouraging one another was a result of the influence of the Holy Spirit in the followers of Jesus. All followers, mature and newborn, adult and child, woman and man, 
boy and girl, were led by the Spirit to encourage one another with God's words. Paul used the examples of the words of psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. There were many psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs recorded or referred to in the Bible. The book of Psalms had 150 of them. After the Last Supper, Jesus and the Twelve sang a hymn and left the upper room, Matthew 26, 30. Paul and Silas sang, sang hymns the night they were in jail, Acts 26, or excuse me, Acts 16, 25. Songs were sung by Moses, Miriam, and others, Exodus 21, 1 to 21, Deuteronomy 32, 1 to 47, 1 Corinthians 14, 15. The Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs taught what to do. They taught what not to do. They taught what to know and think about. They taught wisdom. They praised God. Speaking or teaching and encouraging one another in this way did not require followers to be literate and meet in a Bible study as such. Memorizing the words from psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs and passing along their words was sufficient. The majority of people around the world cannot or do not read, but they can teach and encourage one another with the words of psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Paul had already written that speaking the truth in love makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love, Ephesians 4, 15, and 16. According to Ephesians 5, 19a, every follower in the church was to be involved in this speaking to one another. The result of this action among the followers was growth until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, Ephesians 4, 13. The second ongoing action was directed vertically to God, singing and making music in your heart to the Lord. 519b. Followers of Jesus did this because of his spirit within them. But those who were drunk and controlled by wine sang very different songs and in a very different way. The third ongoing action was also vertical, thanking always God the Father for everything. 520. This was to be done in the name of Jesus. The fourth ongoing action was the second one that was horizontal. Submitting yourselves one to another in respect of Christ, 521. What were they sub to submit to? First of all, they were submitting themselves to the biblical teaching and encouragement they heard from one another, Ephesians 5, 19a and 21. Believers were submitting themselves to the teaching and encouragement of one another. This fourth action resulted from being filled with the Spirit. It was a major point in Paul's teaching. Paul wrote these words inspired by God after many years of starting new churches and returning to teach and correct the followers of Jesus in these churches. He knew how important it was for everyone to be teaching one another and to be submitting to one another. The misunderstanding of horizontal speaking and submitting in the church has led to a reduction in teaching and responding to God's word. The work of the Spirit among his followers is limited when only one person or just a few are teaching the others. A basic part in the life of Christians together is for all to teach, all to encourage, all to listen, and all to learn. In Ephesians 5.21, Paul worked very hard to make his meaning clear because submitting to one another was a new way to act. It was not the way people submitted outside the church. The common meaning of the action word submit to meant that a person who was under had to submit to a person who was over them. But this was not how followers of Jesus were to act. Jesus said that no group of followers was to rule over the others, Matthew 20, 25 to 28. Paul redefined submitting as it occurred in the spirit among followers of Jesus. He described their new way of interacting with one another with these words, be submitting yourselves. This was something followers volunteered to do over and over again. It was the way of life in the Spirit. To this, Paul added one to another. This completed the meaning in their shared submitting. Each one gave up any idea about being over the other one. All 
where side by side, Paul redefined submitting for believers. Paul used the last three Greek words in verse 21 to show it was something done among followers of Christ. Every other time in the Bible, the words in the respect of or in the fear of ended with the word, it ended with the word God. But not here. In verse 21, Paul ended with the words, in the respect of Christ. Three, Christ's example. In group three, which is made up of Ephesians 5, 22 to 32, Paul explained further how followers of Jesus were to be submitting themselves one to another. He gave examples based on Christ's actions. Paul began with three side-by-side comparisons. In each comparison, as Christ was the second and main part. As Christ was Savior of the body, church, 523b. As Christ loved and gave himself for the church, 525b through 27. As Christ loved and cared for the body, church, 529 to 30. The first three examples of how Christ loved and gave himself for the church led up to the statement of the great mystery of how Christ and the church are united in one joint body. This fourth part was the high point of the whole passage of Ephesians 5, 15 to 6, 9. Christ and the church are one joint body. Ephesians 5, 31 and 32. In the Garden of Eden, the first man and woman were joined by God in the special united relationship of husband and wife, Genesis 2, 24 to 25. In Ephesians 5, 31, Paul referred to that relationship in Eden to cast light on the special united spiritual relationship of Christ and the church. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and will commit to his wife and the two will become one flesh. Here is a great mystery. I'm talking about Christ and the church, Ephesians 5, 31 to 32. This great revelation or mystery was not clearly understood by the disciples when Christ breathed on them, John 20, 21 and 22, and then ascended into heaven a short time later, Acts 1, 9 through 10. It became clear to them on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2, 32 and 33, By the time the new followers were gathering together from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria to across the Roman Empire, Paul explained it clearly. The great mystery was the revelation of the wonderful relationship of his followers united together with Christ. The union of the first man and woman in the Garden of Eden was good, but walking in the union of Christ and the church was even better. In Ephesians 5, 22 to 30, Paul linked together the three as Christ examples. He used the word pattern that was used in Genesis 3, 15 to 17. This word pattern used two actions in three parts. As was in the first example, one was in the third example, and both were used in the middle example. In the first example, Christ gave of himself as Savior for the church, 523b. In the third example, Christ loved and cared for the church, 29 to 30. In the middle example, Christ did both for the church, as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, 25b. All followers of Jesus could act in these two ways as well. They could submit themselves to one another first by giving of themselves for one another. They could also submit themselves to one another by loving and caring for one another. Sadly, The context and the content of these verses have been misunderstood. Instead of pointing to Christ's examples of how to treat one another in the body of Christ, this passage has been seen as a passage on marriage. Yet, Paul made his meaning perfectly clear when he wrote in verse 32, I'm talking about Christ and the church. Christ's first example. In Ephesians 5.23, Paul used a joint body word picture two times. A husband and wife were united as head and trunk in one complete joint body. Christ and the church were united as head and trunk in one complete joint body. Christ's example was in how he gave of himself as Savior of the body. Ephesians 5.23. Christ's second example Paul introduced a second action of Christ and added it to the first one. 
Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, verses 525b to 27. Christ's third example, Paul repeated the second action in another way. Christ nourished and cherished the church just as a person cared for his own body. Christ did so because believers are members of his body, verses 29 to 30. Practical examples. In Ephesians 5, 22 to 32, when Paul presented his four points in a row that had to do with Christ and the church, he also added a parallel set of three examples in verses 22 to 30. These three examples pictured how Christians were submitting themselves one to another. After verses 31 and 32, Paul added a second set of three more examples in Ephesians 5, 33 to 6, 9. So we have one, three practical examples paired with Christ's examples in 5, 22 to 30, and two, three more practical examples in 5, 33 to 6, 9. At the beginning of each of these sets of examples, Paul carefully linked them to Ephesians 5.21. These links were made at verse 22 and at verse 33. First, Ephesians 5.22 was linked to verse 21 by one action word. Verse 22 had no action word at all in Greek. It only said, wives, no verb, with your own husbands in the Lord. In the written Greek language, whenever there was a missing action word, as in verse 22, people knew to reach back to the one that had just been used. The action of believers submitting one to another in verse 21 was also the action word for verse 22. Wives, be submitting to one another with your husbands in the Lord. This made sense. If all believers were to behave this way, it certainly could be practiced between married believers, wives, and husbands. Walking together this way in the Spirit pointed to the united relationship of Christ and the church. Second, Ephesians 5.33 linked back to Ephesians 5.21 in two ways. It began with a linking word, and it repeated a key word from verse 21. The Greek linking word used at the beginning of verse 33 was to continue. The word respect used at the end of verse 33 repeated the word respect used in verse 21. Paul also used links inside of smaller groups of verses and words. These were the same kind of links used in the passage in on the Garden of Eden in Genesis 2, 4 to 3, 24. So let's look at Ephesians 5, 15 up through 32. We have a, a diagram in the book. We start out with walk very carefully, and then group one tells how. There are four parts of group one. Through careful walking, be wise walkers, 15b. Two, make the most of your time, 16. Three, make, or understand the Lord's will, 17. And four, be filled with the Spirit, verse 18. As to this being filled with the Spirit, group two tells how. These are the spirit-controlled actions. One, speaking to one another. Two, singing to the Lord, verse 19. Three, thanking the Father, verse 20. Four, submitting one to another, verse 21. As to submitting one to another, he explains that now in the verses that follow. That's group three. So verses 22 to 32 and, and beyond go this way. As Christ was Savior of the body, 23b. As Christ loved and gave himself, 25b to 27, and four, uh, three, as Christ cared for the body, 28, and four, Christ and the church are one joint body. The first three practical examples in verses 22 to 30 were linked to verse 21. Then Paul combined them by one with Christ, uh, excuse me, then Paul combined them one by one with Christ's three examples. In the practical example in verse 22, when Paul used the modified action words from verse 21, submitting yourselves one to another, he was not telling wives or husbands to submit in the non-Christian way. Instead, it was the Christian way of submitting between Christian wives and husbands that was an excellent model for all believers of Christ. Verse 24 echoed the ideas of verse 22. In verse 23a, Paul used the word picture of a united joint body. A husband and wife were members of one joint body, just as Christ and the church were members of one joint body. In the practical example of verse 25, 
Paul told husbands to love their wives with a godly love. Only Christian husbands could show this kind of love. As husbands practiced this godly love with their wives, so too godly love was practiced in interactions of the followers of Jesus with one another. In the practical example in verses 28 and 29a, as husbands cared for their own physical bodies, so they were to love and care for their wives in Christian marriage. In the same way, there was to be love and care for one another in the body of Christ. This set of examples had to do with life in the united joint body of Christ and the church, as Paul stated in Ephesians 5.32. The same was true in the second set of examples. In the second set of three practical examples from the Christian home, Ephesians 5.33-6.9, to Paul again showed the two actions that were part of submitting oneself to one another as followers of Christ. The two actions were, one, to give of oneself, and two, to love the other. The practical example in Ephesians 5.33 that was linked to submission one to another in verse 21 had to do with a Christian man and woman who were husband and wife. If this husband and wife had children, then the practical example in Ephesians 6, 1 to 4 applied to them. If they also had servants, then the practical example in 6, 5 to 9 also applied. The great mystery transformed every relationship of the couple in their household. Each of these transformed relationships were examples of how to apply Ephesians 5, 21 and submit one to another in respect of Christ. According to the first Christian husband and wife example in verse 31, they were to show love and respect as an example of unity of believers with Christ. Some followers of Christ have not yet married. Some have lost their spouse, spouse in death or through divorce. Paul himself was single. Yet all believers shared in the wonderful unity of Christ and each other. Taken out of context, Ephesians 5.33 has been misunderstood. Some translations have inserted the action word for uh, the action word to obey for to respect. But the action word to obey was only used for children, Ephesians 6.1, and for servants, Ephesians 6.5, and not for either of the spouses. In the practical example in Ephesians 6, 1 to 4, if a husband and wife were parents, this practical example applied to them. Children had the responsibility to obey their parents. 6, 1 to 3. By the time children were old enough to understand Paul's words to them from the Ten Commandments, Deuteronomy 5, 16, many had already chosen to repent and were born-again members in the united spiritual relationship with Christ. For the period of their childhood, they were required to obey and afterwards to honor their father and their mother. Jesus did this. As a child, he obeyed his parents while he lived inside the family circle with them, Luke 2.40. When Jesus was old enough, he became a full member of society after his examination by the religious leaders in Jerusalem. From that time on, as a young adult, he honored his parents and submitted himself to them, Luke 2.51 and 52. In verse 4, Paul turned from addressing Christian children to addressing their Christian parents. The Greek word for parents in Ephesians 6.4 was the same Greek word used in Hebrews 11.23. There, it designated the parents of Moses who hid him for three months. This word was like the word brothers, which included brothers and sisters in Christ, Colossians 1.2. Paul warned Christian parents against embittering or provoking to wrath their children. Parents were to be respectful in their dealings with their children. The action word used in verse 4, to nourish, or bring them up, was the same one used in Ephesians 5.29. There it was an action taken by Christ. Nourish and cherish one's own flesh as Christ does the church. Both parents were responsible to nourish their children in the discipline and admonition of the Lord. This important responsibility was taught throughout God's word. Deuteronomy 6.6 6 and 7, Psalm 78.4, 2 Timothy 3.15. According to the example in Ephesians 6, 5 through 9, if a husband and wife had servants, this practical example applied to them. Most people living in the cities like Ephesus at the time of Paul were servants or slaves. Very many of them, very many of them responded to the good news, and so the local gatherings of believers included many slaves and servants. 
Paul's advice to servants and masters illustrated how, even in the context of obedience required in the servant-master relationship, submitting one to another could be practiced in everyday life, especially in the context of Christian households. Paul cautions servants to do everything as if they were serving God and not just their masters, Ephesians 6, 5 through 8. This was how Jacob's righteous son Joseph had lived when he was sold and taken to Egypt to be a slave. He knew God watched all he did. As he obeyed his masters, he pleased God. Christian servants of earthly masters were, first of all, servants of Christ. The earthly work they did was to be done with goodwill as service to the Lord. This pleased God, who would reward them for their service. The position of obedience was not necessarily a permanent one. Children grew up. Slaves could be set free. But honoring and serving were always actions pleasing to the Lord. Masters in Christ, whether the husband or the wife, were not to threaten their servants, Ephesians 5, 9. Paul referred to God's instructions, excuse me, that's Ephesians 6, 9. Paul referred to God's instructions for masters from Leviticus 25, 43. Masters were to respect God. This too was a link back to Ephesians 5, 21. How could Paul tell masters to treat servants this way? Jesus turned his servants into his friends. Jesus told followers to treat each other the same way. In John 15, 15 and 17, Jesus said, No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I, I've called you friends. For all things that I've heard from my Father, I've made known to you. These things I command you, that you love one another. The Basic Christian Church Controlled by the Spirit, all followers of Christ sang to God and thanked God, Ephesians 5, 19b and 20. All were teachers and encouragers from the Word of God, Ephesians 5, 19a. All were learners from one another who applied what they learned, 5, 21. All gave of themselves for one another and all loved and cared for one another, 5, 25b. Finally, all prayed for one another as well, Ephesians 6, 18. The Acts of the Spirit. There were seven acts of the Spirit in the lives of followers of Christ. All followers of Christ needed to practice these acts in their daily lives. Two acts of the Spirit were vertical. They dealt with a person's interaction with God. This was evidence of the new life that Christ gives to those who were born again. Five acts of the Spirit were horizontal. They dealt with followers of Jesus interacting with one another. This was evidence of new life in the individuals who, together, made up the members of the body of Christ. And here are those five acts. Singing and making music from your heart to the Lord, Ephesians 5, 19b. Thanking always God the Father for everything, Ephesians 5, 20. Speaking to one another, teaching and encouraging, from God's Word, Ephesians 5, 19, and Colossians 3, 16. Submitting oneself to one another's teaching and encouragement from God's word, Ephesians 5, 21. Giving oneself sacrificially to one another as Christ did, 5, 23b and 25b. Loving and caring for one another as Christ did, Ephesians 5, 25 and 29 to 30. Praying for one another at all times with all kinds of prayers and requests Ephesians 6, 19, or 18. By practicing the seven acts of the Spirit, singing, thanking, speaking, submitting, giving, loving, praying, all followers of Christ grew in their relationship to God and built up one another in the body of Christ. Ephesians 4, 12 through 13. The helpers in the church. In addition, some of the followers were gifted by Christ to help build up the whole church, Ephesians 4, 11, and 12. There were four kinds of helpers who did this. One, messengers. Two, announcers. Three, harvesters. And four, nurturers. It is helpful to picture the local church as followers. The church is a circle of light. In Christ, the followers... Excuse me, in the church are the followers of Christ. They are the sheep in the flock of Christ. Some are mature in Christ. 
Some are newborn in Christ and some are in between. They practice the acts of the Spirit. They speak to and submit to one another. They use spiritual gifts distributed to each of them for the good of the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 7, Romans 12, 4 through 8. Most of all, they love one another. 1 Corinthians 13. Everything outside the circle of light is spiritual darkness. Those who live in this darkness are pictured as goats. They need to learn the good news of Christ. They need to be miraculously born again as newborn lambs and to be transferred from the darkness into the light. Messengers take the light of the word to those who live in darkness outside the church. They tell the message of the light, the good news of salvation. All those who are outside the church are the goats. Some are drawn to the light and listen. Some turn away. Harvesters have one foot in the light and one foot in the darkness. They receive the goats which are drawn to the light and seek God. The harvesters tell the way of salvation to the goats. And a wonderful miracle occurs to the goats who believe in Christ. They are born again as baby lambs. The harvesters bring in the newborn lambs to be cared for by the nurturers and all the other sheep. Nurturers make sure the newborn lambs receive milk and care. They also watch over and teach the growing lambs and full-grown sheep. Announcers are inside the church. They proclaim the word of God to the sheep who are fed and, and strengthened by it. In the light of Eden, the union of the first husband and wife with each other and with God in Genesis 2 was followed in Genesis 3 by Satan's attack. In Ephesians 5:15 to 6:9, the union of Christ and the church was followed by Christians standing firm against Satan's attack in Ephesians 6, 11, and 18. The sixth passage of Ephesians 4 through 6, Ephesians 6, 10 through 18, began with the words, therefore, stand. Followers of Christ, filled with the Spirit, together in Christ, could stand against the attacks of Satan. Paul ended with the last action that followers of Christ did who were filled with the Spirit. They prayed and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people, Ephesians 6, 18. In the Garden of Eden, there was creation and an attack. Two walked in unity with one another and with God, Genesis 2.25. They were attacked by Satan and were defeated, Genesis 3.1-6. through 6. In the church, there was a new creation and a successful defense against attack. Christ and the church were united, Ephesians 5.32. Believers stood firm against Satan's attacks, Ephesians 6.10-18. through 18. The unity of the church with Christ through salvation was better even than the unity experienced in the Garden of Eden. Together with Christ, empowered by his spirit, believers could successfully stand against the attacks of Satan. Share your thinking. Discussion questions on chapter two of Women and Men in the Light of Eden by Bruce C. E. Fleming. With each answer, Note the verse or verses where it was found. One, how many passages in Ephesians 4 through 6 started with therefore and walk in Greek? Two, where did the passage begin and end that talked about being controlled by the Spirit? Three, what was every believer to do one to another according to Ephesians 5, 19 and 21? Four, what was the link in verse 22 to verse 21? What was verse 22 about? Five, what was the great mystery? Six, do you practice the seven acts of the Spirit? Seven, always let the Bible passage speak for itself. Did you discover the real meaning of a verse? Verse. 